Frank Flukiger, and I am currently serving as the National Chairman of the Constitution Party. I would like to share with you briefly why the Constitution Party was founded and what we hope to accomplish. The party was founded in 1992 by the late Howard Phillips, a prominent leader of the Republican Party. The original name of the party was the U.S. Taxpayers Party, but in 1999, the name of the party was changed to the Constitution Party to more clearly define what the party stands for. The party was founded with the goal in mind to bring back in line our government to its original intent as stated in the U.S. Constitution. Over the years, our form of government has, de has departed dramatically from that intended for us by the Founding Fathers. The Founding Fathers were students of history and were well aware of the natural tendency among men that once given power, they tended to seek greater power, which in turn leads to tyranny and the destruction of the liberty of the citizenry. It was with this in mind that they wrote into the Constitution the things that they did. They provided for three branches of federal government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. Each was given defined specific functions and each was given strong incentive to prevent encroachment of one branch of government over the other, their own branch. Over the past many decades, those lines of defense have long been blurred and even lost. Furthermore, specific powers were given to the federal government and all others were left to the states. The Constitution provided for maximum freedom of the individual. It was designed with the concept that decisions should be made at the lowest possible level whenever possible. Decisions made at that level could meet most adequately the needs of the local citizenry and could be more easily changed if the need arose. Only matters that could not be addressed at the local level were then to be addressed by the next higher level of local government. It was also well understood by the Founding Fathers that the Constitution was written for only a moral and a religious people. It could endure only among such a people. A citizenry that understood that they would be held accountable in the hereafter by their maker for their conduct in this life tempered how the citizenry would conduct their lives in their mortal life. Likewise, from the numerous miracles that occurred during the birth and development of the new nation, the founders were convinced beyond doubt that the hand of providence had intervened time and again in their behalf. They had no doubt that a supreme being governed in the affairs of the nation. May I share with you just one such, one such miraculous incident that transpired in the early history of, our, of the nation. The signers of the Declaration of Independence concluded their bold statement with these confident and faith-filled words. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. They so pledged because experience through the years taught them that there was indeed a protecting hand over them helping to determine their righteous destiny. One such experience occurred early in the French and Indian War. The colonists had taken the French Fort Louisbourg. In retaliation, the French sent a famed admiral at the head of a fleet of 40 to 100 ships with orders to proceed to Boston and lay that town in ashes and destroy all that lay upon the coast of North America. It was not until the month of September 1746 that a man from a fishing boat came into Boston and reported to Governor Shirley that his men had seen the largest fleet of the largest vessels which they had ever seen in their lives, and that these were French vessels. Shirley at once called his council together and summoned the trained hands of the province. The, the council sank ships laden with stones in the channels of the harbor. Hasty fortifications were built upon the islands, and Shirley mounted upon them such guns as he could bring together. Among his other preparations for his enemy, Shirley proclaimed a solemn fast day in which the people should meet in all their meeting houses and seek the help of the Almighty 
and so they did. In Boston, the morning was clear and calm. People had walked to church through sunshine. The Reverend Thomas Prince from the high pulpit of the Old South Meeting House prayed before hundreds. Deliver us from the enemy, he implored. Send thy tempest, Lord, upon the waters to the eastward. Raise thy right hand, scatter the ships of our tormentors and drive them back hence. Sink their proud frigates beneath the power of thy winds. He had scarcely pronounced the words when the sun was gone and morning darkened. All the church was in shadow. A wind shrieked round the walls, sudden, violent, hammering at the windows with a giant hand. No man was in the steeple, yet the bell struck twice, a wild, uneven sound. Thomas Prince paused in his prayer, both arms raised. We hear thy voice, O Lord, he thundered triumphantly. We hear it. Thy breath is upon the waters to the eastward, even upon the deep. Thy bell tolls for the death of our enemies. He bowed his head. When he looked up, tears streamed down his face. Thine be the glory, Lord. Amen and amen. Amen and amen, said Massachusetts, her hope renewed. All the province heard of this prayer and this answering tempest. A southwest gale tore down the bay. It drove ship against ship. It capsized and sank some of the noblest vessels and tore the masts out of others. The whole fleet was nearly lost. The men very sick with scurvy or some pestilential fever. Their great admiral was dead. Pestilence, storm, and sudden death, how directly and with what extraordinary vigor. The Lord had answered New England prayers. The country fell on its knees. Pharaoh's host, overwhelmed in the Red Sea, was no greater miracle. Sir Gladstone, the British statesman, said, the founding fathers were wise men. And in his opinion, the Constitution was the most remarkable document ever penned by the hand of man.